That's fine. So no, just welcome to everyone uh, and thanks for giving up your time. Rusty and Fletch pointed out we have got some great numbers on this evening. So um, we're delighted that you've taken up uh, or given up some of your time to, to come and join us. Just as a little bit of housekeeping, I can see the chat box going already. Uh, I'll try and control that throughout the evening. So if you have got any questions, do feel free to, to pop them in there. We've had loads of questions already through on emails, which we'll try and get through. And no doubt we'll think of some stuff as we go. Uh, Rusty, Fletch, um, well, formerly you were probably more well known for the work, the incredible work you did with the RFU and the stuff you continue to do with the Magic Academy. Sedba courses and Magic are doing some really cool stuff. And hopefully COVID allows us, or, you know, the, it allows us to break out, break free from all of this and deliver, you know, we've got, Stuff in the diary, rugby clubs, uh, rugby camps at rugby clubs, our Easter courses, summer courses, rugby courses in the UAE, rugby courses in Malaysia, rugby courses in Europe, uh, coaching conference in the summer, and the really cool, interesting, latest bit of stuff that we're doing around the Sedba Magic business development stuff. Have we got enough time to do any more stuff? Well, I've got, anyway, plenty, that, that of time. I've got plenty of time because Fletch goes to Dubai on his own. <laughs> <laughs> Rusty, you're the next in line. So the next time we're there, we're there with you, no problem whatsoever. Um, just for a bit of a heads up with everyone, we will send all the people on tonight a link to this webinar and we'll upload it at the well, probably tomorrow at the earliest. If you've got any queries, uh post the webinar, anything that springs to mind, feel free to send some questions across and Fletch, Rusty, myself will get back to you when we can. And for any more info, there's some really cool stuff that goes online through Twitter, predominantly is what we both use at Magic Academy and at Zebra Courses. So give them both a follow if you want to follow some stuff there. And I think let's crack into some talent stuff. But Fletch, give us an update of what you've been up to of late. So you've had a happy Christmas in the Fletcher household, but what work stuff have you been up to? Uh, yeah, lots of stuff. Um, some of the stuff you mentioned, really, trying to be a bit more intentional on the business stuff. So exploring the, the world of business um, in terms of look, how can we help teams and coaches and leadership. Um, sports a little bit slower at the moment. Lots of sports sort of struggling a little bit around finances and getting back into stuff. So, uh, yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, we are working on a player development app, um, which is pretty exciting. So we're excited about that. That's something that'll be coming out fairly soon, trying to connect the coach or teacher, parent and player around uh, uh, around the player's development. So uh, across a number of sports. So that's probably the thing that would excite me the most. Rusty, leading question, because this is what I want you to really answer. What have you been doing with the England rugby team of late? I, I wrote down what I've been doing. I wrote baths, admin, steps, coffee. <laughs> um, repeat, bath, admin, steps. Uh, yeah, no, I, I've been, so I've been doing more work with hockey and, and a bit with Eddie, so that stuff's been going on. Um, I'm not sure if I'll get into Six Nations, depends upon COVID protocols and same as Fletch doing a bit of business. But yeah, they're pretty, as I always say, like, they're pretty keen. Like, we were talking about stuff and they would, they would do something about it, which is like, I've definitely seen them more likely to, to do stuff than than some junior rugby clubs, which is fascinating. Um, so, yeah, no, we've just been kind of disrupting and, you know, fresh eyes and all that stuff, really. Cool. Mate, who's Eddie? Eddie Robinson, I thought we were talking about. The new uh, coach. The That's new attack. Right, isn't it? Yeah. Dropped. <laughs> um, Fletch, let's get right into some uh, really cool information. Who would be the three most talented players you've ever coached? Um, yeah, by the way, Lee Dixon's, Lee Dixon's listening, so yeah, Dicker would, yeah. would be on there if, if Glenn was around, like hard work and graft. And uh, Digger would be number one. I've said that a number of times. He's a, uh, I mean, I love coaching, great guy, uh, doing some great stuff now at Barney Castle. Um, Matt Burke would be one, so blast from the past, probably one for the mums and dads a bit. So, didn't have a huge amount to do with his uh, development, but when he came to Falcons, uh, just just his um, ability to sort of uh, manage the the back of the pitch and his attack and prowess and how he helped each. I mean, he was just outstanding. Uh, Marrow, 
So especially around his physical qualities and his determination to do well and how we would take people on and sort of his leadership skills. And so Mario would be the one. And then Marcus Smith from a skill point of view. So um, we feed my biases around condition games and skill games, but he had some ridiculous skills. Um, and obviously he's a little fella, you know, he sort of had to do it in a different way. Um, he's got quite a unique background in terms of sort of where he grew up and all of that sort of stuff. So they would be my top three, mate, Matt Burke, Marrow, Marcus Smith. You mentioned something earlier on in a, in a conversation about Matt Burke and you compared him goal kicking wise to Johnny Wilkinson. What was the sort of things you observed with that? Uh, yeah, and, and Dick was just saying, imagine, I cut, uh, Dick was probably at the uh, training session. So we... We were having a training session so when Johnny was doing his kicking and Matt Burke said, oh, can I come and join you? And he sort of joined in a bit and I did three kicks and then kind of said, right, that's me. And I sort of said, how does this work? He said, oh, just to me, it's all about feel. So if I feel as all right, then that's me. That's me done. Interestingly enough, like, so his kicking, international kicking percentage was as high as anybody's. But it's just two different ways of approaching the same problem, really. And um, so Johnny would have a different approach, it would be a lot around... Um, sort of high reps, Berkeley would have a completely different approach. It'd be about feel. It feels good. I'm actually going to leave it. And then you would take that into the game. Um, so, yeah, well, that's the story. So, Rusty, any different? you got three three performers. Well, I haven't coached my Burke or Maritoje, so uh, Fletcher's uh, got a... Um, uh, yeah, I would say Marcus had double up on that. I think from a skill point of view and probably brings to life like how important your environment is so his upbringing Brighton College uh, growing up in Singapore significant stuff going on there and then also like now if I'm honest like I think if he was playing super rugby we'd be saying this guy's a rock star um, Tom Curry probably brings to life loads of stuff around mindset and you know probably the siblingy type stuff a little bit as well uh, had some unbelievable mentors as well with like Richard Hill and Peter Walton. And then I had to pick a sevens player just so Fletch could say pineapple. Uh, I think Tom Mitchell, I think Tom Mitchell has been a world-class sevens player for a number of years. And I would obviously have a good <clears throat> understanding of kind of his upbringing as well. And didn't really come through academies and definitely developed later and you know, all the stuff going on there. So that'd be my top three. Fletcher's would beat mine on a really small pitch. Uh, I think mine would win on a bigger pitch. So I think Tom Curry would would excel against Marrow in bigger space. Big, big shout, big shout. Just touch back on to Tom Mitchell and sort of talent transfer. Could could Tom Mitchell play 15s? Yeah, but I think I think there's a view of you know of of lots of coaches that, that they're two different sports, and I, I think he would rip up in the prem. Uh, Rory McConaughey makes it look pretty easy, if I'm honest. And to be fair, Rory wouldn't mind. You know, he's not the, he's not, he's not one of the best sevens players in the world. But he's come and done a job for Bath, and he's played international. And yeah, of course they could. I, I, I think there's a, a an element of like people think that like people in the, are, 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 if some you know, I, I think of this from the championship point of view as well, actually. So people might go someone in the Premiership's like they're eighty three out of 100 and someone in the championship must be in the 60s but often they're like in the 80s as well they just have don't have the opportunities or I know you referenced earlier we spoke a bit about luck as well so yeah well I'm sure we'll, we'll delve into that. Cool Fletch will share some stuff with us in a minute but just stay with you Rusty what does in its purest form talent mean to you in the coaching world? <laughs> no mate let's get Fletch to talk about it he's much better at it than me. <laughs> Fletch over to you. Okay, uh, I'm just going to share my screen. <laughs> Rusty's, Rusty then now mocks me because he thinks I love a presentation, which is not true, but it might yeah. be easy just to talk through some. Did you find your blue Peter badge, by the way? Uh, no, I haven't found it yet, but I am still looking. I've, I do think I know where it is. Um, just yeah, just going to share some stuff around talent. So just a handful of slides, share some stuff, and then fire some stuff into the chat room and obviously we'll come out of this and we'll start talking. We've also had some questions sent in as well prior to this. So it's in no particular order. Uh, so a definition, it'll be in there somewhere. So this one is a talent is an athlete's innate um, or learned ability. Oh, sorry. Uh, to combine factors that come to a performance is successful whole. So 
kind of you're kind of born with some stuff you can clearly learn some stuff but you're going to combine some stuff and you're going to do well that's kind of what talent is stuff that we're going to delve into is going to be around the four areas so talent identification lean into talent selection so a big part of what we would do would be around that um talent development and then talent confirmation probably spend less time on talent confirmation however it is really important that sort of transitional stuff that when you go from a program into something else, it's uh, sometimes yeah, that can go wrong for people. Um, so it may or may not come up in some of the questions probably. <clears throat> so uh, talent, look, there's loads of stuff. If you Googled it, there would be a lot of searches. There's lots of information, there's lots of books. No matter what you read, it'll kind of come down to, to this. So I like this because it's really simple. So talent sits in the middle of a good training environment and some good practice around that. It sits in the middle of some genetics. So especially with some sports, they would be more relevant. I wouldn't be very good at rowing. Um, I wouldn't be that good at a certain position in rugby just because of some of the, some of the, some of the genetical type stuff. Um, so as it says there, so it's a combination of environment. It's a combination of psychological stuff. It's a combination of genetics. And as you guys have mentioned, sometimes it comes down to look I always tell the Toby Flood story. So Toby Flood was doing pretty well, come through the international stuff quite late, didn't play 16s. Um, England under 18s actually had three teams. He was in the third one, was starting to come through. Actually, there were some injuries at the club. He got, he got an opportunity, played fullback and had an absolute stormer. Now, it was of no surprise to me, somebody who'd known him quite a long time, that he'd go and do well, but it was a surprise to others. And then that actually kick-started his, his whole career. And he got confidence from it and got in different environments and just just flourished. And that's an example. And there'd be lots of examples out there. Sometimes it's, um, it is good planning, but sometimes it's down to circumstances. But Fletch, Fletch why, why, would they, why would they be surprised? Just because they hadn't seen him or they had a, had a different view of him? Or... Yeah, there's some stuff around perceptions. Probably hadn't been intentional enough for like sort of checking out the A-League stuff and seeing how we'd been going. I can always remember when I showed these uh, highlights of the under 20s, I used to get them and used to get them sort of clipped up and I used to make sure all the senior coaches, so this is the time when I was in the academy. So I used to, and like the look on their face, this game, I can remember when I shared some of uh, Dicko's stuff and they went, oh wow, he can play. I went, yeah, mate, this guy can play. Like, why aren't you watching any of the games? Um, so yeah, I think um, the best programs are where it is completely joined up. You know, the first team director or head coach would have a real good awareness about like what's come through and then also not like judge to, um, you know, how many times do we hear Rusty around? Um, coaches are very quick to judge within the performance space. So first team space, like they're really quick to judge. Can and can't is language they use a lot. Is, isn't. Um, yes, no. When that's just not the reality. I, I always encourage people to go and watch England against New Zealand 2003 World Cup final. Faz plays against Borden Barrett. England play really well and should win, but don't. The Kiwis beat us. But it's a fantastic game. And you'll see these guys who go on and are now world-class players. And, yeah, they're, they're, like, doing some stuff that isn't that sharp, really. Um, it's just it's just part of a player's journey. So, um, the, the next one I just want to share is, like, it. Like, uh, there is different journeys. Ford and Fars are coached them when they were... Uh, well, 40 was 15. 40 came in at, 40 played for England under 18s at 15 years of age. I mean, it's quite remarkable. Uh, so both these guys played England 16 years young, had, you know, had loads of opportunities. It was, it was obvious. It was obvious that they were going to go through and play for as long as they stayed fit and reasonably motivated, these guys were going to play for England. The one on the top right is Joel Launchbury. So actually was in an academy, but got released, got released from Quinns, went to Wasps. There wasn't any international stuff, so he wasn't seen as one of the top players. He managed to get into an under-20 World Cup because of injury. Uh, played in the game because they have to, basically played against Italy. Played well. They thought, oh, wow, this, this guy can play a bit. Put him into the next one, played well, and then, you know, the, the, he's just continued to thrive. And then Mark Wilson, international debut at 29. Um, got to actually play the series. So the first time he played, he played in the series, he went international and got to play the series. So completely different journeys. Um, one thing you should never say in sort of talent development is is never because it sometimes comes in bites on your backside. It might be not yet, or it might be probably not. But you, you know you've got to be really brave when you say he will or he won't because 
Um, are there people that you thought, uh, I feel like I'm taking over Duff's, are there people that you've, you, the flip of that way, you've gone, uh, this person's definitely going to make it and they haven't, or this person won't and they have, or you're yeah, more considered than that? Yeah, um, yeah, I mean, Alex Gray would still be the one that, um, like, sort of causes me some some thinking time. Um, played all the way through the England stuff, captained all the way through, played young. Um, I mean, huge physical potential, really skillful, ended up going to sevens and doing various things. But, yeah, things just didn't work out. He would hold his hand up definitely and say, actually, maybe if I had my time again, I would have done some, made some different decisions and made some different choices. However, I think some other people have got to take some responsibility as well. I'd be really confident. Like, this sounds like a really mm -hmm. arrogant thing to say. I'd be really confident if I continued to be part of his development that he would have played for England because the guy was just... Well, it, yeah, he was outstanding. I can remember he played against the French and the, the French came over, we beat them. Um, and, he, and he came over and he, you know, we'd always have a chat. He said, if I could take one player, I would take your eight. And then he went to New Zealand for a period of time. So um, he, he went to New Zealand and we got a report back when we're at the Fal um, Falcons and stuff. And he, yeah, it just said, look, this guy would, this guy would be an all back. However, they did reference some of his behavioral stuff then. Um, so he would be one that stands out for me. Fletch, I don't, I don't know if you're going to go into this a little bit later on, but one of the questions already submitted early doors was about sort of, you know, talent petering out and just fading away. And, you know, what are the different sort of, and to you, Rusty, what are the different kind of reasons as to why that happens? I think there was a, there was a guy that played for Oakham School that broke the internet for the RFU. Was it, um, I know his name, it was Tyrese Johnson Fisher. Um, was, was the absolute speedster. And I think every rugby sort of keynote had seen this video and was like, wow, he is going to make it. That is a serious talent. But we see it at clubs and we see it at schools as to why, you know, you start off like an absolute rock star and then it just fades a little bit. Are there any other reasons as to why that happens? Yeah, I mean, I've got a view, so I don't think it's that helpful for somebody like Tyrone really to be put them in that position. All, all, all you do is you sort of add a bit of pressure, and especially when they're quite young. Um, I know you're 17 and 18, but that's still quite young, but especially when they're younger. And um, there's, there's actually some strong evidence to suggest that they're probably not going to develop uh, as well, some of them, just because they're probably less likely to take risks. So if they get lots of uh, affirmation and lots of cool things said about them, the last thing they want to do is for that to change. So they actually change their mindset. So what's got them into that position, they, they, they actually change a bit. And then all it does, so imagine that Duff's that he's got your place. Like, how determined are you now going to be? This guy's on the internet. It was a yeah. question. Rusty, any thoughts? Yeah, I was thinking, yeah, I was just thinking of some practical solutions. So, uh, you know, and, and stuff that kind of resonates with me having just written my life in rugby, but having a mentor. <clears throat> so you cannot underestimate the impact of Richard Hill MBE on both the curry. That is an amazing opportunity for them to, to help them from a skill and a mental point of view. And, and that would be it, like, also, like, how are we being intentional around the, the psych stuff? And is it, you know, some little bumps along the way? Or is it, you know, is it this, is it this, and, and where are we stretching them? So those best players, you know, playing in 50 nil wins, scoring, you know, five tries a game, like, What's, what's going to happen when they get to the next level and what's going to come next and how do we help prepare them for that? And then the last thing that I think is, and I'm Fletch will speak about this probably better than anyone is, <clears throat> is just the case formulation stuff. So you spoke already about people being on the same page, understanding like where this player is. And certainly with the, the stuff I thought you did unbelievably well, it's like the National Academy stuff around case formulation so you probably explain that way better than me yeah I will I think it'll come up and if it doesn't we'll sort of jump in a bit so um let's just you know, let you just go back one just one slide I'm sorry mate I just wanted to touch on that mentorship thing because I'm trying to make it relevant for, for, for schools and clubs and in, in everybody's world that's on this evening we were on a mentor, mentorship course together at some point and it opened my eyes a lot around mentorship but in terms of schools and clubs now for to for developing talent within those environments, you know, are they looking as well as the coaching to to buddy up with some mentors? And can that be can that be players 
in a couple of older groups? Or does it have to be, you know, adults had the experience, been there, done it kind of thing? Can yeah, I just give you a, can I, I was just going to give you an example from we're doing it with a business at the moment. You you choose your mentors, you get two. So I actually think it's helpful to have more than one. Um, we, 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 we suggest that one might be outside of your discipline. So it's quite helpful, you know, so Fletch will speak to lots of players because he's not in their club and he can help them make sense of stuff. Um, so who it is is important, but also like then how do you upskill them? So if it's the under 16s mentoring the under 14s, which sounds like a great suggestion for, for both parties, then how are we upskilling them and helping them be effective at mentoring? Because that's going to help them with the rest of their lives as well, quite frankly. Cool. Sorry, Fletch. Carry on, mate. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, Premier League football, I mean, most of your mentors on that scheme, that, that each each uh, candidate, I, I'm supporting a head of coaching and um, there's two mentors. There's a skills mentor and then there's a sort of I'm the mentor around coaching stuff. So, yeah, I've, I've, yeah I would agree with everything there. I mean, my, my, my vision generally of sport, and it does happen in some environments, clubs and schools, is that like, and the older ones have their session, then they just hang around. And then like the younger ones come and you just have this conveyor belt of sort of people helping, helping each other. I think it's, um, and we do it. We, yeah, we do it pretty well at the cricket club where often there'd be people who are older um, and they're just hanging around with some younger kids and the kids, the kids love it. They absolutely love it. Um, Cool. I'm just going to go on to some, so there's just a couple of other things. Just going to touch a little bit on relative age effects. So relative age effect is just, it's basically sort of um, where you are through maturation type stuff. And it's sometimes influenced by when, by when you were born, especially with the younger age group. So uh, what have you noticed about those two duffs? Oh, mate, one's the captain, one isn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're actually the same age group. So actually... Actually, the little fella's older. I think he's like six days older. So they're from the same age group. Now, look, if, if they're sort of hanging around and, and sort of in the same sports team, then you're probably likely to, to pick the tall guy who's sort of physically a bit more uh, robust and stuff. And this, this, this happens a lot in, in, in all sports. Um, and I just want to um, share a couple of bits of information. So, I mean, I know you can read, but basically it's saying that these relatively older players, often people who are born earlier or and who are through maturation earlier, they're more likely to be selected and then that leads to better opportunities, better coaching, better stands of competition. So advanced physical maturity is often mistaken for talent. Um, and as a result, selection of teams and programmes, um, yeah, to, to the expense of the sort of late... Um, mature and, and I think I've got I think I've got a graph so that's so this is from academies and academies do know what they are doing you know so they have an awareness of this and they have an awareness so this is a this is a few years old now um, so but this is selection into programs of 13s 14s 15s 16s 17s so Q1 is kids born September October November all the way down to Q4 which is a kids born June July and August so there's a massive skew if now it shouldn't look like that and it doesn't look like that. So by the time you get to senior international rugby, it has kind of evened itself out. It's more like 25, 25, 25, 25. Um, just through the yeah, just through the process of um, you know, people having similar opportunities. So you just you need to be really mindful that if you're making decisions around selection, you're selecting people into certain positions or certain teams, that you just have some information and you certainly have an awareness of relative age effect because like, it will influence you. Go as on. you can say, so, and obviously what therefore happens is that this, the, the blue, so if you go back to the graph, the blue are, are the ones that are dropping out and that, you know, we, we, we keep a high percentage of purples in the game. Um, and so a couple of things like, uh, we might say they're developing some helpful skills of beating the bigger players, some psychological stuff. What would be your advice around this? So I'm going back to what can people do? Like the bigger, more physically mature player playing rugby and the person who's, who's having it tough because of some physical stuff. What, what would your advice be? Yeah, just, uh, um, I mean, uh, there'd be a number of things, really. I think just, and there is flexibility around playing up and down in terms of age groups. I don't think your date of births are 
is a good indicator for like what team you should play for. It's a good indicator when you should have birthday cake. Um, so I think we'll be more creative around, often we're pretty good at pushing up. So we'd be pretty generally good at that. But I think, I think some kids would also benefit from maybe sort of staying in an environment for a little bit longer. But yeah, you're right. The Q1s are, are the actually, um, um, I mean, lots of those actually sort of don't stay in the game. So they find it quite easy. It becomes a bit more difficult and they're not having as much success. And that's actually a bit of a shock. And um, so quite a few of the, those boys and girls kind of sort of remove themselves from, from that. So we do need to be mindful around giving people different uh, experiences, different opportunities. So across age groups, different positional stuff. So I'm actually, although my wife stopped it, I've got Q1, 2 and 3. We stopped. Uh, she didn't want to go for Q4. But Oli used Q1. Um, I mean, I've seen it all, really. He was given unbelievable opportunities, opening the bat, keep wicket, ball, um, playing any position he wanted in rugby because he was having like a lot of impact. And it would take me to step in as a dad to go, well, look, I think you should be challenged in different ways. Um, like, let's play in a game where he's not allowed to run through people. He, like, has to create space or he has to try and get some kick stuff. Because I knew that everybody would catch him up, and they did, and they have, and lots of them have gone past him. However, he'd back himself now that he's quite a skillful player. So, I'd, anything else from you, Rusty or Duff? So what else would you be thinking? Yeah, I just think it links quite nicely to a question that we've had submitted already. It's around, you know, that um, keeping these talented uh, people involved in the sport longer. So what kind of experience does it look like for them? So there's a talk about when they get to sort of the cult stage and the dropout of, you know, of the game, even a little bit further down, when it becomes too easy for them, you know, what's, what's the strategy to get them, you know, chomping at the bit to still be a part of everything that they do? Yeah, just different challenges. So different challenges. So Rusty mentioned before around the, maybe the kid has find it too easy. Um, I mean, evidence again would suggest that the, the ideal playing programme would look like you would have some environments where you do find it, you know, not easy, but like relatively straightforward and you would find it, you'd also have an environment where you find it pretty tough and you'd probably have somewhere in the middle. So I'm always conscious around the people who I'm sort of trying to support and influence that they actually have those experience. So, um, so one of my boys is quite good at cricket. So he still plays his own age group at cricket, but we would set him different constraints. Like actually, why don't you go in with a thinner bat? Or why don't you try and score at this rate? Um, so we set him some different challenges and then he's, then he would play an environment that is like really tough. Like he's like, he's, <laughs> he's, like, um, he's probably not having that much success. Um, so just be really intentional about trying to give people a, a mixed range of of, um, of environments, but definitely be mindful of those kids who are who are often born early in the year and also physically mature. Now you can get kids who are born in September who aren't physically mature. So don't just take the fact that they're born that they're born early. It's, it's a combination of their sort of bio, biological age and their chronological age, but it's. It's information that you should be um, seeking out and you should be, certainly it should be help inform your decisions around their programmes and how they're doing. Um, how much does um, how much does failure play a part in talent, talent development? Yeah, I just, oh, yeah. I was, can I just, I was just going to say, <clears throat> probably bring on to that, but <clears throat> I like Mo Bobat's question around how much winning or how much success does this player or this team need? So actually have a, so often... You know, some players are having way too much success and some are probably aren't having enough, you know, and that's, but then also like, uh, how can we create a level of pleasant frustration? So people are at different points and then also like, and how are we helping them deal with it? So if we know that the, the psych skills, so self-regulation, you know, that, that kid who scored lots of tries and is moaning at the ref and he's probably replicating what his dad does as well. Like, how are you? How are you helping him with that or her with that? And then the other thing I wrote down is also like multiple positions. So between games, within games, I think that would be critical, especially in our sport. Yeah, again, look, I, I, I company coach a, a guy who's, who's ended up in the front row and it's hilarious because he'll sometimes start there and then end up playing at first receiver. He'll, he'll end up playing 10. And that would just be quite normal in my world, really. Um so me and Rusty will speak a lot about this in-game changing positions. Some coaches are oh, well, it, it it like 
it causes chaos and disorder. Yeah, that's the point, <laughs> or that's part of the point. But um, yeah, the kids, like, or the players, they're you know they're generally pretty cool with like sw like switching around and being given different challenges and different. Like, have you got some? Have you got some good examples? Some age grade stuff of players that played multiple positions. I'm thinking of Tom de Glanville, but you've probably coached more. Tom played three different positions for England. So he played ten wing and fifteen and. Yeah, I mean, certainly lots of the backs would. Uh, obviously, lots of back rows convert into front row a bit, um, but they're comfortable. I think Sale do this uh, well, actually, around the under-18 competition. So they they would generally take... Um, sorry, players would sort of move around positions more in their games. They sort of hooker jumps in at the back row a bit. The back sort of shift around. I mean, it's more of a recent thing, but last two or three years, I've noticed that about Sale. Uh, in 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 games they are moving people's positions just to just to sort of just to expose some stuff and you know people would sort of categorize that as a performance program um yeah so yeah i think it's important um th th this is just some id talent selection stuff i think the falcons do it well so they come up with this uh, gasp um so this is what they're looking for game sense attitude skill set physical so what's our physical potential type stuff so um so you've got to score pretty high on them i think what it gives you is a framework so when people are having so they're talking to them about players in their region but this is a language that they'll use um if you're in their reason i'd be surprised if you're not that aware of it uh, you've actually got if you're not in their program you've got to get three nominations based around gas to then be invited in but as soon as you do get three it, they can't come from parents, but as soon as they do get three, then you're invited in. Um, so I think that's in, that's important. Just in addition to that, uh, so people often ask me, so I spend a lot of time sort of looking at players. So um, I'd, I'd always focus around their best bits because that's clearly what they're capable of. I'm not that worried about stuff that's not going that well. I'd back myself to coach them, obviously. Um, I'll try and put them in like both shirts. So if Rusty's playing nine against you, Duffs, and you you sort of have some moments and you do certain things, I'm straight away thinking, well, what would Rusty have done that? Um, I would try and create opportunities. So actually, can we influence the referee? Can we influence the type of game again? The Falcons or lots of their early talent ID selection stuff, they've like modified the games, they brief the referees, they create situations and opportunities that they want to see, basically. So, like, it can't be an excuse or where the winger hasn't touched the ball. They will in their environment. Um, just be really mindful of the stuff we've spoken about, like, well, they're through maturation. What's their physical age? Sorry, what's their biological age, their chronological age, and their training age? How long have they played rugby for? If you played rugby, like, since you were three and somebody's been playing for a year and you're both doing the same, the chances are that the guy playing for a year is probably going to go past you. And then reference points, like I think it's fortunate for us, the more experience that you get, you can sort of compare it to what you've seen in the past. Like this time, this time last year, I watched Elliot Daly and he was doing that sort of stuff. So that's also stuff to consider when you're sort of looking at it. Fleck, um, what's your uh, view on, on trials, apart from you should wear luminous socks to uh, get yeah, I, yeah, mate, well, um, oh, my middle boy is going through something similar, really, and I just say, mate, you want to wear like a fancy colour hat. So I don't know if they've noticed, but he's always wearing like a bright hat. Um, what's my view around trials? I don't look. I think if it's a one-off, it's it's fairly pointless. I think it's, I think having some like competitive stuff as part of an assessment. So the Falcons do it over a long period of time. They have festivals. They have training days. They have big numbers. Um, like they do take their time and they do consider, and then you can get back in. Uh, I think trials are fairly pointless, really. If it's kind of a one-off type stuff, it's like, it's it's it, it's 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 down to look, and that's why not a lot of people would have. Yeah, so some people had bad experiences of that. It's like how you turn up in the day. I, I can remember going going to a trial and I had tonsillitis. Um, I mean, I played. There's no way I wasn't going to go, and I I played all right, but I was absolutely, I was really poorly, um, and yeah, and I didn't get picked. And I just thought it was like really unfair. I'd played really well in the games prior to that. And so that that kind of influenced my stuff around that anyway. And at what age? So you said like a Farrell at 14 or 15, you would be able to go, this lad's going to go and play for England. What about like 
Billy or Mako or other players like that? Same age, different age? No, oh, different age. Mako would be like 18, probably just post 18, actually. You'd probably be like, yeah, I think this, well, pretty sure this kid will go on. Billy would be younger. Billy would be one like younger. His first uh, kick off at the wreck. Um, we kick it off. He tackles a guy, turns him, gets on his feet and rips it. And I thought, yeah, he'll do for me. He's like got a high chance. Other players would be a lot later, mate. So it's easier in the backs generally. So Anthony Watson, Elliot Daly, like somebody has to play for England. So it's not as if like somebody has to play. Other players would be a little bit later. So Dan, Dan Robson came through later. It was a fly off, scrum off. Really started to like pull up trees about 18. I, ironically, it's taken them quite a lot of time to get in there. So yeah, it would be different for different players. Some it would be like, but yeah, it would very rarely be, well, it would never be, I would never make a judgment on before a kid went through maturation. So like 15, 16, like they've, they've gone through maturation. 40 was quite early through it. He was that size and he had a, you know, he was like, um, and right, last last couple. So this is this is this is Tom Curry. So this is the stuff that I think sort of sets people apart. And I do take Tom because I do think he's a world class. If you pick up the best team this moment, moment of time, he'd be in most people's back row. There was an article in the paper not long ago, and he was in pretty much everybody's back row. So this is the stuff that I think is important. Uh, I'm just going to delete this. So so competitive because it'll give you like a good beat the game mindset type stuff. Um, so I think that's really important. Tech, tech, physical, psychological. I think you're going to have to be like good, good at all three. I do think you can play international rugby or be professional rugby player and just be good at two, possibly even one. But I think to be a world-class player, you've got to be good at all three. And I think he is. <clears throat> so he's like, his rugby stuff's really strong. Uh, <clears throat> his physical stuff is, I mean, he's just a machine really. And psychologically, he's very robust. You know, incredible. And that would then move into the next one, which is around driven. Almost people talk about this obsession. So what I've noticed about the very best people is like they are they are very driven. They're almost obsessed. Um, they are generally well supported. There's a sort of lots of um, researchy stuff out there around parents and um, mentors, coaches, all of that sort of stuff. It's really tough to make it if you don't have that support. Um, it's one of the things that I would always look for. Wouldn't just be a parents, but like what school is he at? Who's the people that they're hanging with? What sort of club they're at? If then, if I don't feel as though they're well supported, can we actually look to support them on that? Can we get them into different environments so they can get well supported? Um, what does uh, what does uh, poorly supported look like? Um, I mean, look, lots of it would be their parents stuff. Just like not not there to watch, not there to sort of taking them places, maybe not that helpful around the, some of the questioning. Um, probably getting to the school where maybe the school are a little bit more about the school and kind of sort of, um, you know, not, not that mindful about doing the best thing for the player, then that would be the same in the club as well. So I, I, I don't think that's that well supported. Believe it or not, there'd be some people that would want, wouldn't want you to do that well and sometimes they call you friends. So I've noticed... Uh, I think there's been a couple of players hijacked a bit by their friendship groups. Um, I've seen that a bit. Other sports would talk about it quite a lot. Um, so, yeah, that's what that would look like. And then the last one was around it. Go on, mate. No, I was just about to say, it's, it's really interesting linking it to back to schools and clubs again, is that that supported element is massive. But the only way you're going to be able to offer support is if you get to know the, the guys and girls on a more personal level. You know, so what time you spend with them off pitch, and what you're talking about and how you shape conversations to be able to support them properly. Yeah, mate, absolutely. You know, I, I, absolutely. And look, I'm not saying you can't come through, but it's really difficult. It's a lot easier if you are well supported, both from a, you know, from a friends and a family point of view. And then through the, you know, the stages around, you know, you know, your club, your academy and yeah, it is important. It's 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 a lot harder if you don't have that support. If you don't, it's just another question I was going to ask Fletch, and I was thinking a bit around, and he's not a he's not a world class player yet. He might be eventually, but someone like an Alfie Barbary actually decided to stay in an environment where he probably felt supported from a school point of view. But I imagine he could have gone to 
any number of other schools or places on scholarships. So what are your thoughts around that as well? Uh, look, I think it's individual. It, it felt right for, for you know, clearly him and his parents um, thought long and hard about it, got some advice about it. But yeah, he, he actually thought as though that was the best environment around his education. And and actually he was afforded different, you know, different experiences at school. He would play a lot in different positions. And I, uh, yeah, I think that was, that was the making of him really. He would often be not a one-man team that that would be unfair to the rest of the players but he would be um yeah he, he'd be given some experiences that would be helpful i think um i think an, an easier option would have been to go to a, a stronger school and to be supported by other players a bit uh, however i don't think he would have come through either or yeah, to yeah. be honest <laughs> and then the last one here is just around experiences um look and maybe that's something that that clubs and systems could do a little bit better is to is to you know maybe get them into some different environments and give them some different experiences where they have to work some stuff out if if nothing else and what I've noticed about really talented players is that they have real good self-awareness they kind of get themselves a bit um yeah they've you know they've just been exposed to some amazing stuff and then hopefully the learning that comes from that but um, I think again they would need to be reasonably intentional about it this is it. Just some information. Just we spoke about lots of this. Um, and I know there's a question early. These would be some like major principles around talent. Like let's um, you know let's have some different experiences, different sports, different positions. From a governance point of view, a single pathway is helpful. Not having lots of different strands, so nobody knows what the hell's going on. Many eyes, many times. So it's over a period of time. We spoke about chronological, biological training age. Keep it as broad as possible for as long as possible. I mean, parents are keen. Parents will have a huge influence, especially when you start in this sort of talent journey. But even, you, you know, so um, George Ford will speak to his dad every single day about rugby. Like, why wouldn't you as a coach or as a system be speaking to his dad as an example? And there'd be lots of players like that. Uh, all. Ollie Lawrence, who's just got, got in, you speak, right, who's your hero? Like, who's your rugby hero? It's my dad. You know, you would want to hang out with his dad to like really to get to understand Ollie Lawrence type stuff. Competition's key. Look, it's got to support it rather than kind of getting in the way. Sometimes it gets in the way a bit. You would want people who know what they're doing, <laughs> um, obviously. Um, we sort of talk about this case conference and, and I'm going to come out of this in a second. We might want to sort of talk a little bit more about that. But also, as the players get a little bit older, they need to start taking more and more responsibility. So ultimately, at about 17, 18, as a broad brush, they should actually be kind of running their own development, really. 17, 18, 19, possibly a year out of school. Um, and then it does need to be planned, especially around the transitions. So I think the transitional stuff, when you leave school, when you're coming out of academy into the seniors, um, you know, when you're going into a sixth form, they're, they're big moments, they're big transitional moments. And uh, I think systems need to be looking to, to support people. Cool. Good man. Take a breath. Unless you're talking about case uh, formulation, Fred. Yeah, so the case formulation is fundamentally about putting the player in the middle. Ideally, ideally the player would chair it after a period of time, two or three, the player would go... Well, these are the people that I want in this in this sort of case formulation. Um, the initial case formulation, ironically, doesn't have the plan. It's about the relevant people getting in the room and just, and it's as easy as a SWOT. You know, what's the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, strengths? But we're gathering intelligence and information around the player. And then the player obviously very quickly becomes part of it and then very quickly will be leading this process. Um, and it's and, and it's just as simple as that. The individual sports do it really well. Best I've ever seen it done is in swimming. Um, so swimming, I actually was fortunate enough to sit in a in a case formulation when they went through a number of athletes, and it was just sensational. And the, and the athletes were in the room. The athletes were running it. And look, I expect this off you. And the, check, the coach was challenging that. S and C was challenging the physio. But basically, you get the people who are going to support this person, and you basically come up with a plan. But before you do that, you actually find out some intelligence and some information um, that's going to help the player. That's yeah, that's class, personal. That is class. Thanks, mate. There's a couple of questions that we'll just fire into some questions in the last sort of 10 minutes. You mentioned multiple sports. Is there any sports in particular that would complement rugby well? 
Yeah, so when I was at uh, the Falcons, we used to talk a lot about like uh, some form of fighting sport, judo, because I, I love the push and pull. Lots of rugby is about trying to to manoeuvre force. And then basketball, don't think there's any, any greater sport around movement and agility and just deception, anticipation. Net, netball would be equally as good and it's a great game because you can get, um, you know, so if, if you can't get into basketball, definitely go and play netball. Um, so we used to tell all the all the rugby lads, you get your school to get a netball team or basketball team. So basketball and, and judo were the two that we used to sort of push. It is, I mean, all sports would, would uh, benefit, mate. All sports. Yeah, Rusty, anything to add? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, bit of gymnastics, and then Big John Afoa played basketball. I asked him why he's so good at rugby and passing. He said, "Because I play basketball." Uh, Japan last World Cup wanted to be the best moving team. I think we. We often don't think of it in terms of movement. We often quite early get into like the weighty type stuff. I spoke to uh, Tom Curry about like what it looked like for him. It was lots of body weight stuff. It was other sports. It was, yeah, that's, that's, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable diet. And I guess Fletch would say there'll be an eventually an age where you almost can't do everything because you've got exams and other stuff and you probably specialize a little bit more, but Loads of the loads of the lads would still do bits and bobs of other sports, and you know Fletch loves his cricket. There'd be a lot of rugby lads that would play a bit of cricket as well and continue to do so. Would there be any benefits of sort of individual sports over team sports? Uh, no, not really. I think a combination. I think it, I think yeah, individual sports are cool. You know, it's kind of you against the world a bit. Um, so look, I, th I think I think when they're little, when they're really little, and I'm sure you're going through this now, Duff's uh, with your girls, and yeah, you know, we went through it. Just like go and sample, just go and sample, and then they'll find stuff that they either like or they're good at, or they, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And as Rusty said, it will narrow a little bit, and probably by the time they're 16, you're probably down to maybe like three, sort of maybe a winter sport, like uh, maybe one winter sport, two summer sports, or, or vice versa, depending on what it is. And then ultimately, you're probably going to have to choose a winter and a summer sport at some point. Um, but up until then, like, I think you should sample. I mean, my, like, rather than having yet another rugby session on a Thursday night, maybe you should just go and play five a side football. I mean, it would, it's basically pass move, trying to yeah. find space, trying to. Or even, or even once a month, you know, just something a little bit different. Yeah. But there's a bit of chat as well going in the, um, the actual chat box, which is, is really relevant in, in developing talent. The, the New Zealand model, the Kiwi model of sort of weight over age, size over age, how does that fit with you guys and your sort of yeah, I think it was, a, I mean, it was a great solution to a problem. It was mainly in the North Island, it was, and it was mainly around a certain age group. It, it basically, it was around the start of maturation, and it, was, and it was on the North Island. And I think it's a good solution to, uh, to what the problem is. We don't, we don't have, um, I don't think we have the same problem. Um, but I think it's something to consider. I think I said earlier, we need to be more creative around your, to me, your date of birth is like when you have birthday cake. Let's be, unfortunately, we, we regulate in this country hugely because people cheat. Now, to me, I, you, like, I would have less regulation and just like ban, just like, people soon find out who's cheating, who's picking somebody just to win a match, then just don't play them. There's a couple of teams up in our area that like nobody plays. Um, just because it's not a very nice experience. So, um, so yeah, I think it was a good solution. It's, it's something worth considering, but, I mean, we don't have that problem. You know, we, I, I, we, we, I think if it was a classroom, we'd differentiate. <clears throat> and, and so I think we should be doing that in rugby. I think it would be individual. You could definitely have a big kid playing a game where their mission is to not get tackled, and that might be beneficial for them. And it might, might be beneficial for everyone else, but also... You can have a really heavy kid who's just not powerful and can't move that much. So we'd have had lads in the pathway fletch who've, you know, they've been 128 kilos prop and we've taken them to South Africa and, and, and they probably wanted to come off the pitch at that point. So, I mean, it's not like, it's not just weight. It's the same as it's not just your birthday. It's, it's everything. It's like, yeah, well, you know, and, 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 like, can this kid kick? Can they pass off both hands? Because they want to go and become world class. They're going to have to be able to do lots of stuff, especially as the game evolves. So the other thing with all of this as well is if we're looking at 13, 14, 15 year old kids, then we're also not thinking about the game of the present. We're thinking about 
where it's going to go. Yeah, good show. And then what does... Um, I'm trying to rattle through the questions. The chat box is going really well. And I've still got about 18 questions down to ask in the next six minutes. Uh, hence, there's not many secondary questions. But where do you look at in terms of, you know, it's a really sort of heavy... Actually, I know you've done some stuff with um, some swimming bodies and talent around there. But what does a lifestyle look like? So, you know, if I'm an aspiring rugby player from whatever age to whatever age, what, what would a really healthy, balanced lifestyle look like? Yeah, look, I think, I, I mean, answer it slightly differently. I, I think you've got to get into a good flow during the week. So you've got to understand that there's, um, let's take that you've just had a game, that there has to be an element of recovery. There has to be an element of training with, it, like, it has to be adaptive training. You have to be getting better. So you need to challenge the type of skills that in the, in the, what the session looks like and your physical stuff. So you, so, so you have training that's going to like adapt. You're getting stronger and faster and you're going to get, become more skillful. And then there needs to be a process of tapering. And then what young people often don't get into is they don't recover that well. They're like, they're trying really hard to like get better. Sometimes maybe the practice design isn't helping them and they often don't taper. Mm -hmm. So they often like, they play it too much generally. Um, and they don't get in this good flow. Play, recover, train to get better, taper, play. Um, now you sometimes might might want to might want to play through that. So I would with our our kids a bit like we would go well. We haven't tapered that well, but actually I just see the game as part of their training type stuff. Um, but yeah, so there'd be some other stuff like or, like we only ever do two hard training sessions. Two two days and then the third day is either low key or rest. Too many kids go hard hard hard, <laughs> like play rest. They just have no rhythm to the. And then obviously there's the additional stuff around your nutrition and your diet and your rest and your and your balance. Just having real good balance. Um, I mean, you should turn up to a training session and just be so excited and just like just ready to go. And if you're not, if you're not feeling like that, you probably need to have a look at it a bit. Cool. And then Paul, yeah, uh, say that again, just, Rusty. I'm just going to add on to that. So, um, J JC, who's, who's the SNC coach of England, he said, if we're going to be the best rugby team in the world, we need to be the best team in the world at recovery. So, actually, how serious are you about recovery? If you want to do, like most teams are starting to do now, like this real big test session in the week, you need to be able to recover really well. Um, interestingly, in hockey, uh, Danny Kerry would swear by dual career. Like he said, like, just have a bit more perspective and clearly it's a different sport to rugby. There's, there's less money involved. Uh, same as what Fletch said, where in the week are you going to get a stimulus? Now that might be where does like your exploration or your failure exist. So it might be that on a Monday, I have this really stimulating time in the week where I'm growing a bit and that might not be allowed later on in the week so as Fletch said that that weekly flow and then the last thing is like where am I putting psych in all of this like it can't be a workshop it needs to be an all the time thing how can I get and I love this phrase of the day and Fletch will now have it but uh, like self-regulation is a metacognitive skill so actually being able to realise I'm about to lose my with the referee or I'm about to, and, and I can stop myself or I understand what the triggers are. So where are you practicing the psych stuff would be the other thing that I would have, all of those things would have helped me in my career. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny, isn't it? When you sit back and reflect on, on that as a coach or from this side of the fence now, it's, uh, yeah. Anyway, mate, you've not done too badly. Yeah, I could have done better. <laughs> I could have done better. It's like my school report. Um Paul Holmes uh, has asked a question around the importance of academies compared to schools uh, in, in a development phase. Have you any thoughts on, on are they separate? Are they uh, yeah. in unison now? Yeah, it should be, mate. It's, you know, it should just feel like um, really connected and joined up. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly you know, the player should th th sort of feel that. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, obviously what academies are, it's just about an elevated experience. It's about like people sort of coming together with with people who have more time to to sort of spend uh, on being experts around there, you know, about what they do. Like if they're a rugby coach, spend more time thinking about their rugby sessions. And Kevin, uh, and Kevin Tiller at Leeds Beckett's done a great piece of work on this around the physical side of this. And I like his analogy of, 
if there was a piece of tra tracing paper with your school schedule on and a piece of tracing paper with your club and then a piece of tracing paper with your academy and then your England and you put them all on top of each other, would it look like something that was organised or would it look like an absolute show? And often, so we would have spoken to players, Fletch, who, who were training nine, ten times a week, playing a couple of games and, and strangely enough, didn't get picked for England because we actually had to give them rest. Like, that's not helpful for those kids, quite frankly. Yeah, there definitely was a couple of times they used to come in our sessions and just do like light bike work because they were so tired. It was, uh, but any, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, it's got, I mean, clearly, you know, plans and thought, thought out plans. And that's where I think parents come in as well. Better informed parents will look to support the players because the players will want to play. People want them to play. Um, but yeah, I think if we're better informed and again, and, and there is some stuff out there, but I, I do think we need to be a bit stronger. And I've just kind of, what, well, what stuff do I know? We, we, the teams I work with try and have a much better rhythm to their week. And we have some rules like, like if somebody turns up to me on a Saturday and they train hard on a Friday and some schools do, and they play for the school on a, and it's a trip, like they don't then train with us. They know not to turn up because you can't go hard, hard, hard. It's just like, that's, that's not fair. So you can definitely go hard, hard, but the next day has to be either a rest or a relatively light day. So there's some basic rules that I think if you, and then just have the conversation. So try and influence maybe either that Friday night training session or, or whatever it is. Um, so yeah, that's the stuff that I I'm going to set you a challenge because we're very good at keeping to time and we're going to go about one minute, two minute over, which is absolutely fine for the first one of series two. But this is a really good question. So what is the biggest challenge facing UK talent in sport today? Not COVID. So what would be, in your opinion, the biggest challenge to nurturing talent today? Go on, Rusty, I've got mine. Oh, mate. Well, uh, <clears throat> in my opinion, the psych stuff is often the differentiating factor and our attention to that and how we deliver it. Probably coaches that aren't psychologically informed enough. And then the other thing I wrote down was probably our competition. So some of the stuff that we do wouldn't prepare us for the, for the big stage. Yeah, yeah, I would go competition one because I think it drives behaviour like nothing else. I, I, and my second one would be parents. I think they're often like just... Um, yeah, sort of left on the side a bit. And, and, and I think we need to be even more intentional about the parent, the biggest influencer on the play, on the parents, on the guardians, on the, that support stuff. They spend the most time with them. Is how can we actually like get them to be many coaches when they need to be? Of course, they need to be parents as well, but just to give them some better information. So they would be my, but competition changes behavior like nothing else. Class, listen, we're going to leave it there. Thanks so much for your time tonight. And thanks for everyone else logging in to, to listen to some thoughts. We could go on and on. And I think what we will do, because you guys uh, are pretty good with us, we've got a few webinars coming up next week. We're listening to Ali Crossdale from Saracens in the England Shadows team. Uh, Josh Hodge, Newcastle to Exeter, who's been an England apprentice. They're going to give some thoughts around their journeys. Um, but we'll have you back on again. There's some good stuff, nudges around mentoring, and exploring that further. We're definitely going to do a webinar around the Sedba Magic business stuff. And uh, let's see how we go. But again, thanks for everything. Thanks for everyone coming in uh, and listening to us. We will.